Today is Friday, December 3rd, 2021. My name is Leslie Wilborn. I am a, currently a doctoral student in the Higher Education and Student Affairs Program at Oklahoma State University. It is my pleasure to be conducting an Oklahoma State University Oral Histories Research Project under the guidance of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Today, I am honored to interview the current University Registrar for Oklahoma State University, Ms. Rita Peaster. So Rita, why don't we begin with you telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, sure. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. So thank you very much. Um, so I've been the University Registrar since early in 2018. Um, I've been with the Registrar's Office since 2006. So I've been here uh, a little over 15 years, I believe. And um, it has uh, just been a, a wonderful, wonderful time. I just, I really love uh, working in the registrar's office and I'm honored to be serving currently as the registrar. Well, we are pleased that you are our university registrar. Well, thank you. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your educational background. Sure, absolutely. So I um, am a graduate of Oklahoma State University. Um, I graduated here uh, in uh, 1989 uh, with a bachelor's degree in mathematics and then I went on to graduate school at Texas A&M University and I earned a master's degree in mathematics. Um, from there uh, I started my career uh, in the insurance industry as an actuarial analyst um, and then I, uh, my family ended up moving back to Stillwater and um, I uh, rejoined uh, my friends in the mathematics department uh, as an instructor, uh, and which was a lot of fun. Uh, then I, I moved into the IT department, and I worked in the IT department for quite a few years, starting out in um, instructional um, support. Um, so the precursor to today's uh, ITLE department is where I started out. Then they formed a project management office, and so I was luckily able to join the project management office uh, and uh, earned a certification uh, as a project management professional, and um, did a lot of work on the software team. Uh, and then I was in uh, 2006, I was recruited to come and join uh, the registrar's office as an associate registrar. So I had the pleasure of speaking with um, Dr. Robin Lacey. Yes. And he was unable to participate in the Oral History Project, but I did end up speaking with him for about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting how your background played directly into what he was really hoping to develop and build for the registrar's office. He had made the comment that while technology was not his strength, as he knew he was growing closer to retirement, mm -hmm. those were the type of individuals that he really wanted to bring mm -hmm. into the registrar's office. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that he would be very pleased with your background uh -huh. and how you are leading the registrar's office because I think that was his vision of the future because of technology coming in the way that it did. Well, that's very kind. He certainly left an amazing legacy. Um, you know, one of the things that that we get to participate in as, as a registrar at OSU is um, joining with our colleagues, our registrars from other Big 12 institutions. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget when I first uh, went to my first Big 12 registrar meeting and uh, the registrars there were talking, they talked a lot about uh, Dr. Lacey and they would talk about a lot of his sayings and, and uh, they loved him a lot. So, and I know that uh, the the colleagues that we, we still have um, one uh, of our assistant registrars, Paula Barnes. Uh, she was here when Dr. Lacey was registrar. She's our longest standing uh, um, employee in the registrar's office. Uh, so anyway, I've heard a lot about him. I have a high degree of respect for him. Very nice, very nice. So you talked about the Big 12 registrars. There's mm -hmm. also other associations. So why mm -hmm. don't you talk to us a little bit about those associations, how important they are, and really mm -hmm. what you bring to those organizations as a representative of Oklahoma State University. 
Sure. Well, uh, at the statewide level, there's the Oklahoma Association for Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, um, otherwise known as OACRO. And, uh, you know, it's a small group, uh, but we typically have about 100 uh, folks from, from across the state that will come to the annual meetings. And it's really um, such a, a wonderful way uh, to collaborate with others who are doing the same type of thing that you're doing, uh, be able to bounce ideas off of each other, uh, troubleshoot, and just have camaraderie with others who understand, you know, the same types of situations that you're in. So um, it's a great um, a group uh, to help provide professional development for our staff. So we try to send as many of our personnel as we as we can to those annual uh, professional development opportunities. Um, and then we as one of the larger institutions in the state, you know, I'd say the best one, um, <laughs> um, but <laughs> I'm not prejudiced <laughs> at all. No, but you know, we do, pro we do provide uh, something of a leadership role in the statewide association. So I'm always uh, supportive. I've I, um, had leadership roles from I think about 2009 to about 2015, I started out as a vice president of professional development and then uh, was uh, honored to be nominated to uh, serve in the three-year presidential uh, cycle and then uh, finished out my time on the um, board as treasurer. Um, and I've been uh, supportive of ensuring that we always have someone from our office that can help serve on the board. Um, just to help provide uh, resources uh, to the state. Um, but we learn so much uh, from others as well. So it's really a wonderful um, association. And then at the national level, uh, there's the American Association of Collegiate Registrar's Admissions Officers, or ACRO. And, um, you know, that is, uh, I have, I, I always try to attend um, those meetings and receive lots of, um, uh, regular correspondence from them on what's going on in higher education in the in uh, the country uh, internationally um, what's happening with uh, emerging policy or issues related to uh, student records um, and I've had the the honor to serve in a, a leadership role uh, with ACRO as well I uh, joined um, the, they had a committee on, or they still do, they have a committee on uh, state and regional uh, leadership. Uh, so the leaders of the state associations or regional associations. And then I served as vice chair and then chair of that. So, so probably I would assume that from those organizations, they were probably very helpful as we needed to address COVID-19 pandemic. So why don't we go ahead and jump into a little sure. bit of what you can share with us on how the registrar helped with Oklahoma State University, its you know awareness, preparation, and maybe still what's even ongoing today. Sure. So uh, you know when when uh, COVID hit, um, there were so many things that uh, my, my entire job changed, and I think that's true for so many people. So it's not that I'm you know, unique in that. But, um, uh, and the association did their best to, to try to offer guidance and, and bring together leaders uh, from across, uh, you know, the nation to talk about what they were doing and to, to conduct surveys and share the results of those surveys. But, so the first thing that I think um, that changed uh, for us that was, uh, that I directly worked in was commencement ceremonies. So, you know, um, we, uh, everything shut down in the spring of 2020, in the middle of the spring semester. And so immediately uh, it, was, it was determined that, well, we had to make decisions about what was gonna happen for spring commencement. So, um, you know, with everything uh, that we did, lots of collaboration, just bringing the right, you know, bringing uh, the, uh, key stakeholders together, you know, president's office, um, students that were impacted, um, those who could help put on a virtual, uh, you know, commencement. And so just trying to bring everyone together and determine, just talk out pros and cons and see what 
what may, might make sense. So that first spring of 2020, we, we elected to postpone commencement, not do a virtual commencement. The students really wanted to just wait. And at that point in time, I think we all thought that this was going to be over with in a few months. You know? <laughs> they were really hoping that we could, you know, have the ceremony in August of 2020. Um, so anyway, so so we, we postponed it, but we did uh, work with ITLE and O State TV, uh, who's now inside OSU, uh, but to put together just a, um, a video to celebrate the graduates. We, we um, provided a way for the degree candidates to upload a photo and, you know, we, we com combined all that. So we just did a celebratory kind of a video at the time we would have had commencement. That was the first thing we did. Then in December, you know, then as, <laughs> as, as time marched on in 2020 and it became apparent that, well, it's probably not going to be feasible to hold a, an in-person ceremony. Um, we made the uh, the decision to it was diff very difficult decision to have a virtual commencement ceremony. We we felt we had to have a commencement ceremony, and so we uh, we did a virtual ceremony in December, um, recognizing all of the class of 2020 uh, graduates, and but also at that time let the students know that when we were able to have an in-person ceremony, our class of 2020 would be welcome to come and walk. When we when we did that, so so the virtual ceremony in December was different than just the celebratory video we did in May, and then in May of 2021 uh, we did have our return to our first in-person commencement ceremony, um, but we did it outdoors in the wonderful Boone Pickens Stadium uh, with social distancing and masks. So I. I've done, we've done commencement, you know, three different ways. And then this, this fall and next Saturday, actually, uh, we're preparing to return our commencement ceremonies to indoors at Gallagher Iba Arena. So it will still be different, a little different. A few, um, you know, new precautions uh, due to COVID. Um, but um, so commencement has been a big, um, a big activity uh, that is required a lot of collaboration, a lot of change, a lot of um, uh, just trying to uh, navigate the situation with, with key stakeholders and, and with students and determine the best way to, to proceed. So it's been um, a labor of love. I don't, over your shoulder, we've, I've got a big picture on my, on my wall over here that you can't see, but it's, it's, of the, it's an aerial shot of that that May 21 ceremony in Boone Pickens Stadium. So we'll it will always to, hold a special place right. in our hearts. We will have to definitely take a picture of that, and be able yeah. to use it um, yeah. in the video itself. But I, I could mention some other things um, sure. related to COVID. So another thing that, um, you know, that first spring semester uh, that was determined is that due to the huge disruption uh, in the um, academic environment that spring, it was determined uh, that we wanted to give students the option of electing pass or no pass grades for their classes. And so um, we had to, so um, had to just work to understand, all right, if we wanted to do that, how would we do that? Is it even feasible in our student system? And so we quickly uh, worked to determine um, um, how we could make that happen in our student system, how we could, uh, and then we worked with IT to develop a, IT has been wonderful throughout COVID, uh, really throughout everything that I've, and I guess I'm, <laughs> I have a special place in my heart for IT as well. That's my, uh, that's my former family. Um, but they developed um, a, an online system where students could go in, see all their classes, and just after grades had been submitted by faculty, determine whether they wanted to um, keep that original grade or take the pass, no pass equivalent. And then getting all that back into the system and on the transcript. So that was a huge effort. Um, and we were just, I was really pleased to be able to help provide guidance um, and then trying to communicate all of that out as well. So with um, things beginning to return to probably a new normal, 
is that a process that you see staying on or was that a limited process because of the pandemic situation? Sure, the pass, no pass, uh, we just, at Oklahoma State, we just did that in the spring 2020 semester. Since it was, you know, the everything happened, the changes happened in the middle of the semester and there were, it hit everyone by surprise. Um, so there are some institutions that may have um, continued that in like summer of 2020 or fall of 2020, but not many. Most institutions um, like Oklahoma State, we just did that for the spring semester. Um, but then um, after spring, when we were looking toward to fall of 2020 and really wanting to bring uh, everyone back to campus, trying to navigate how to have in-person classes again, but do it in a way where social distancing would be possible. Uh, it required a thorough review of our, our class schedules, um, looking at um, uh, so many different factors. We ended up uh, a really completely changing the fall 2020 class schedule. And unfortunately, we had to do that after students had already enrolled in their classes. Um, but, but you know, we just, everyone pulled together and we did the best that we could. Um, again, that's another time when IT really uh, came to our rescue. We collaborated with them and they created some tools for our office that allowed us to make some changes to the class schedule in mass. Uh, so, um, and we, we had to work with a huge facilities team led by Casey Shell. Uh, the university planner. They went out and found big, huge spaces on campus that are not meant, uh, you know, not intended to hold classes, such as um, Colvin Center uh, basketball courts, you know, indoor hockey arena. Um, we used some of the suites in Boone Pickens Stadium. We used the O Club in Gallagher Iba Arena. Uh, I mean, just places all over campus. We used some of the big rooms in the in the library and converted them uh, into uh, classrooms. And then we had to determine, you know, what's how many students can we fit in there? Uh, I, it, there was just so much more than I could possibly explain all the effort that that went into uh, revamping the fall 2020 class schedule. Well, I think it shows the dedication that your office and many offices mm -hmm. have not only um, for the university, but specifically the faculty and the students, mm -hmm. wanting them to be able to get back in a safe environment. Right, right, right. And then we had to do the same thing for spring of 2021. <laughs> and then we just determined that, you know, that uh, in, in early 2021, it was determined that our fall 2021 should go back to more normal class sizes. Um, and so then we had to undo what we did. <laughs> so our poor class scheduling team, I mean, my goodness, they have been uh, so amazing. Uh, they haven't complained, you know, but we have kind of been through the ringer in terms of changing the class schedule one way, you know, blowing it up to enable social distancing and adding all these new classrooms and adjusting even the times, even the breaks between classes and then having to take that all back uh, in time for fall 2021 so anyway it's been a journey well as a student <laughs> I'll speak for all students we thank you and thank <laughs> them for all of their work uh, well it's it's an honor to serve and you know it's a, a huge teams of people uh, beyond our office you know Um, so why don't we, um, I think we probably jumped in um, a little bit, why don't we take a step back mm -hmm. and talk about the role and you can, you might be able to give us um, a little bit of context as far as really the term registrar, what that means to a university, mm -hmm. but if someone was to go out and look at um, the Oklahoma State University website, they may see that there's multiple registrars. And so what kind of is the difference between university registrar versus some of the other registrar titles mm -hmm. that we may see out there? Sure. So give us a little lesson on okay. <laughs> a registrar. Oh goodness, well the registrar's role is really wide. 
I was really kind of shocked when I first came to the registrar's office, not knowing much about it, how much the registrar is responsible for. Um, uh, let, so I might just start by answering the second part of your question okay. and then circle back to the re what the registrar is. But So the university registrar, when you have uh, an institution with multiple campuses, there can be uh, registrars that are over just a certain school, like many institutions uh, may have, uh, like our, um, our Center for Health Sciences has their own registrar that handles the courses um, and the enrollment and the transcripts for that, uh, for that school. Um, and the, the university registrar, so there could be different, different ones, the university registrar it handles the overarching um, uh, responsibilities for the institution as a whole. So, um, and the, the responsibilities include the uh, everything that is assembling everything that's in the university catalog, um, and we focus. Uh, it starts with the courses. What courses does the institution offer? Um, what degrees do we offer? Just recording all of that. We don't make the decisions on which courses or degrees to offer, but we are responsible for accurately recording all of that information. And then in addition to recording what are the courses, what are the degrees, uh, constructing the schedule of classes for every semester. So we take all the information from every department and ensure that every single section of every single class is set up correctly in the student system we maintain the student system. Uh, we, we maintain the system then for students to be able to register in the classes. So once the classes are set up, we've got to facilitate the system uh, for students to register in classes. We, pr uh, we help ensure that the system that, that advisors and students have to plan their registration uh, is, is available. You know, when I was a student, in fact, when I first came to the registrar's office, we just had paper catalogs of the class schedule. Uh, everything was on paper. You know, since that time, we've been fortunate to be able to have new systems that allow you to create a, a plan online, you know, and save the plan. And student and advisor can do the, these things, you know, virtually. You don't necessarily have to be looking at, at, at things together, although you certainly can. And then, um, you know, once students register in classes, then we facilitate uh, the systems for faculty to enter grades. And then we we ensure that those grades get into the system and then onto a transcript. Uh, and make sure that everything else that goes onto a transcript, that the GPAs are calculated correctly, academic standing is correct, honors are, are, are correct. Um, and then uh, once uh, we also maintain a system to uh, for the degree audit. Uh, so all the degree requirements uh, are, are scribed in, into the degree audit system. And that's another thing that we've been able to implement since I've been in the, in the registrar's office uh, is a, you know, a university-wide degree audit system that is embraced university-wide. Um, so students can get online at any time at the undergraduate level we're working on it with the grad college so it's not quite there yet for first grad students such as yourself uh, but but we're working on it um, but the undergraduates can get online and take a look at any time see all their degree requirements all the classes that they've taken how those classes match up to the degree requirements uh, what they have left um, you know in order to finish their degree and um, and then once uh, degree, uh, degrees are conferred and we've worked with the colleges to uh, confirm that students have met all their degree requirements, then we ensure that those degrees get posted on the transcript along with any um, uh, degree honors. Um, and then, you know, make sure that students can access their transcripts. We, we've got to make sure that transcripts are accessible to students. We also help certify um, a lot of things about student records. Students need official verification that they're enrolled many times for um, insurance purposes or to apply for scholarships, uh, to earn financial aid sometimes, uh, and to uh, verify that they're still eligible for loans. Uh, we also um, 
provide the certification services for our student athletes. Uh, we help to uh, we, uh, provide a athletic eligibility certification. We also um, are experts in veterans benefits uh, certification to help students who are eligible to earn VA benefits um, uh, qualify for those. Um, goodness, we, we maintain so many publications. Uh, you know, the, the catalog is one um, uh, that, that includes, you know, things I already talked about. Uh, we provide enrollment guides every semester with uh, the academic calendar uh, we maintain. Um, the commencement programs, that's a very important one. I know everyone wants to have their name listed perfectly in the program. Uh, along with their degree listed perfectly in the program. Uh, so we have a lot of um, a lot of publications. I'm sure I'm missing some. <laughs> um, oh, and then we also just maintain there, you might not think that there'd be many changes to a student's record over time, but there are. Students change their majors over time, uh, their names change, um, grades change. So facilitating all the changes and ensuring the integrity of any change to the academic record, um, ensuring that students' records are protected. Uh, you know, we still have um, original student files that are in paper form or they're on uh, microfish, uh, microfilm form. And uh, we've been, we continue to make progress to get all of those digitized. Um, because those forms are uh, the, the paper and the microfiche, they degrade over time. And they are, uh, you know, if we have, you know, God forbid, a, you know, a, a leak in the roof or something, you know, those, those uh, uh, records are subject to, you know, being destroyed. I think we had talked at one point about uh, years and years ago, I think there was a fire. Yes. Uh, and some of the student records were unfortunately destroyed at that time. Um, so, you know, that's something we never want to have happen. So, anyway. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it is obviously a very big job. It uh, is. It is a huge <laughs> job. And it was interesting uh, while researching for um, this interview, um, one of the things that I had come across was a survey about um, how many students randomly sampled across the university if they asked do you know who the registrar is, or do you know what the registrar does? Uh -huh. um, it was, you know, a pretty impressive number. It was about, I think, 60%, which is pretty impressive. And um, I think a lot of it probably um, changes over time because mm -hmm. so much stuff is now available mm -hmm. um, through the internet and online right. and technology has changed all of those mm -hmm. things. You know, you're no longer standing in line and you have the signs behind you right. that would have probably reminded someone you are at the registrar's office because you need to enroll right. or you need to pick up your transcript. Right. So much of those things now are done online. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. These, these signs, uh, we found them when we were reorganizing our records library. Um, I love to just to collect some of the artifacts from, uh, you know, the previous, um, previous, iterations of the registrar's office. I just have such a high degree of respect for what it, what it took to maintain the records. Um, you know, when everything was done by hand, I just can't imagine collecting all those grades by hand and then hand uh, typing the, updating the transcripts one at a time. I mean, it's just amazing um, what, what had to be done. So I have a high degree of respect. Oh, nice. All right, so um, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the relationship that you feel that the registrar has with um, applicants and students, mm -hmm. and maybe then even faculty, talk about those relationships that you have with those groups of people. Sure. You know, um, although we may not have a lot of, um, I, I guess as far as applicants go, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we maintain the university catalog. So it's the basis for students who are looking to see what degrees, can, what degree could I earn at OSU? You know, what do the classes look like? Um, if, so we provide the basis for, um, 
applicants and prospective students their ability to see what's possible at Oklahoma State. Um, uh, you know, current students, I think I mentioned earlier, all the different ways that we uh, provide services to our current students. And you know, we're one of the, um, the few offices, I think, on campus that regularly provide uh, services to former students as well. Because if former students need a copy of their transcript or proof of their records, uh, they need a copy of their diploma, uh, or have any questions about their records, then we're the, the office that they come to. Um, advisors, we provide, um, we've, we have ongoing relationships with our advisors. We provide a lot of student uh, services to them uh, through the, the degree audit system, you know, student issues, registration issues, changes to, to student majors and things like that. They're just such an important uh, part of the university, such an important part of student success, so we are you know, partners with them. Um, and then faculty, um, we provide, uh, you know, we maintain the system where faculty can see the classes that they teach, um, although there's a, another system, um, the course management system, or the uh, um, Canvas, you know, that's, that's not uh, managed in our office. So there's, we're not the only ones that provide those kinds of things. But um, uh, so just uh, providing uh, services for faculty to uh, access their class lists and upload grades. Um, oftentimes we get calls when someone has a problem. You know, we, we tend to help folks troubleshoot issues. Um, you know, if a, if a faculty member um, is, has had a student that uh, needs to withdraw or, or, or dropped a class and needs to get back in and they're not sure what's the protocol for that, you know, we just help uh, to provide guidance in terms of, of uh, policy. So, and uh, then with administrators, it's a key, um, uh, relationship as well uh, to just help um, we tend to the registrar tends to be a go-to person although not the only one but a go-to person uh, to help provide uh, reminders or guidance on policy university policy uh, and and historical practice we, we can provide a lot of information about um, historical context for things as well when well, it sounds like with all the records that you keep there's probably quite a collaboration between you and the director of financial aid and the bursar mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're relying on your information to complete their yes. task and activities for the students. That's right. That's right. Yeah, every class that we create, uh, we've got to work with the bursar uh, to ensure that billing can appropriately be handled for, for the courses. Uh, we actually have kind of a unique, it, it was surprising to me when I joined the registrar's office, but we have a role uh, that's kind of with uh, collaboration with Bursar and with Academic Affairs uh, when students um, have some adjustments to their tuition fees. Sometimes our office is involved in assisting with that. Um, yes, financial aid, we do have a strong relationship with them. Um, we're involved in federal enrollment reporting, federal degree reporting, which um, impacts uh, student financial aid. And our degree audit system, they've taken advantage of the degree audit system to help ensure compliance with federal uh, aid policy. So yes, and with admissions, I mean, we have um, uh, key partnerships with, with many of the other offices across campus. Okay. So with you and your staff maintaining all of these records, why don't mm -hmm. we talk a little bit about some of the, um, you've mentioned it a, bit, a little bit, but talk about some of the reporting that is required by the university, you know, on a state level with the regents and then mm -hmm. federal level with IPEDS. Mm -hmm. Sure. At Oklahoma State University, most of those, uh, the federal um, uh, IPEDS reporting and the state uh, unitized data system reporting, our institutional research area handles that, uh, but in many registrar's office, the registrar handles it. So it's just kind of a, a factor of how Oklahoma State has uh, divided those key responsibilities. It used to be, though, that the registrar handled that. In fact, when I first came to the registrar's office, there were 
pieces that the registrar's office was still responsible for along those uh, reporting uh, areas, but it's just over time, all the reporting has gone to, to other areas. But we certainly utilize a lot of those. Um, but we do submit the enrollment reports to the National Student Clearinghouse, which then um, provides the data to NSLDS for federal aid. Um, okay. Right. Why don't we uh, switch gears just a little bit mm -hmm. and let's talk about state and federal legislative impacts um, to the university that you're required to fulfill. Sure. Well, I think the registrar's uh, role is, is famous for uh, being the, the FERPA uh, go-to person on campus. So FERPA stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. And it is a law that protects uh, student uh, educational records. It protects the, the privacy of those records and also provide students with some rights to review and inspect their records. So, um, so uh, and over time, sometimes there are changes uh, to the FERPA, to FERPA regulations. We, we went through a, a change in uh, uh, around 2009. There were some significant changes to FERPA that we helped um, implement. Um, uh, ensuring that um, uh, that uh, we validate the identity of uh, of students before we and others who have access to the student records before we disclose them. Um, help ensure that that the campus uh, has training on FERPA so that we so that folks around campus have a basic understanding of to whom they can disclose what kinds of education records and to whom we cannot and things like that. Um, there are, uh, I mentioned that we help uh, provide uh, veteran education benefits. There are uh, changes all the time at the federal level to uh, veteran, um, veteran laws about veteran benefits. So it is just an ongoing uh, uh, job to keep track of those and help ensure that we uh, remain in compliance with those. Uh, NCAA has a lot of changes to the athletic eligibility uh, requirements. And uh, so our wonderful athletic eligibility team in, in conjunction with athletics and the NCAA compliance team um, stays on top of those. Um, and there are just a variety of other things that, that, that uh, can occur. <laughs> at the state level, I mean, you know, since COVID, there have been quite a few, um, you know, laws at the state level that have been enacted that uh, that impact us in one way or another. That, that's where those, um, like the ACRO, the, the, the National Association or our statewide um, associations can be so helpful uh, to help keep us informed of things that are either changing on the legal landscape at the national level or if we've got even our own state regents uh, changing policy that affects all the, the state institutions. Those um, staying engaged in those is really essential. Nice. All right, so we talked a little bit about um, uh, Dr. Uh, Robin Lacey. He mm -hmm. was seeing the future coming with technology. Mm -hmm. So if the same question was asked of you, what changes do you think is coming mm -hmm. to not necessarily just the registrar's office, but some of the functions and activities and services that the registrar office provides? Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to look into the future, what changes do you think are coming? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, I believe that it's that the uh, continued um, evolution uh, of technology is is just gonna it's gonna keep happening, and I I think that's probably uh, um, it's never gonna stop, uh, and it's it's it, so I think for example, let me give you an example. Um, I, my, one of my goals before I, I leave the registrar's office here, um, before I retire, is to uh, help us get to a point where we are sending transcript data in a truly electronic fashion. 
So right now, uh, when a transcript is sent to, um, when it's when it's when a transcript is received by an employer, mm -hmm. you know, then you you ex you probably want a piece of paper that you can look at and read and see the classes and the um, the the degrees and things like other information on it. But when another but when that transcript is received by another institution and they need to um, take the classes and um, train, you know, add them to articulate them uh, on, the, on their uh, transcript, uh, then it's a very manual process if you just have a piece of paper or a PDF document and you have to look at every single one and articulate it manually one at a time. Uh, well, there are many uh, institutions across the nation and internationally who have a true electronic exchange of transcript data, where instead of sending a paper transcript or a PDF transcript that has to be manually processed by that receiving institution, uh, the, the um, course data and degree data is received electronically and, and they have processes to um, electronically translate that into their system. Uh, that is, that not only is helpful for that receiving institution in terms of um, making their processes, um, you know, easing the manual burden on them and uh, providing operational efficiency for them, but that is going to help the students because they will be able to m quickly be able to understand how the courses that they've taken will transfer to that new institution and understand um, what that means in terms of the degree they want to earn at that institution, uh, you know, and help them understand and, and make decisions. So uh, that is uh, one of my goals is to help us. <laughs> and if we can achieve that at the state level within Oklahoma, because if, if, if OSU just sends electronic transcript data, but the other Oklahoma institutions can't receive it electronically, um, you know, then that's, that's not really achieving the goal. So my goal is to see what we can do at the state level to really get a true electronic uh, exchange of data. And at that state level, exactly what you're talking about, each institution has to be able to send and receive. Right. And I would imagine that that also would help with the authentication. Mm -hmm. um, in the validity of the information where unfortunately, um, you know, we do see a lot of um, falsified information, mm -hmm. um, doctoring, right, um, right, paper records. Uh -huh. Right, right, that's true. There, there is, uh, you're right, that if you can receive the data truly electronically from the institution um, and there are uh, protections that are built in to help verify that that data came from that institution, then you're right, that will help um, alleviate issues with falsified records. Um, another th way that I see uh, things transforming in the future is in terms of the kind of um, credentials that uh, students want to see from the institution. So another emerging trend across the nation in addition to the data that students have on an academic transcript is something that's called, uh, today it's called a comprehensive learner record. So there are a variety of things that can be on a comprehensive learner record. But in addition to academic uh, information like courses or progress towards degree, um, a comprehensive learner record can contain information about a student's co-curricular activities. It might include information about um, internships they've had, uh, study abroad experiences that they've had. It tells a more comprehensive story of the student's experience and the skills that they've gained while they've been at the institution. So uh, these, uh, this is still a, really a very new idea. Um, but I believe that this is where um, uh, student academic records are going to be morphing to in the future. Um, and I, um, it's going to be exciting to see, uh, to see what comes of it and how we shape our, um, our academic records going forward. So if I'm understanding you correctly, currently 
the academic transcript is really about the academic classes, your achievement of those classes, and then how that translated into an honors or a degree. Mm -hmm. But because, especially at Oklahoma State University, there's so much more that the student participates in mm -hmm. and contributes to, right. and it's really taking those activities and giving them a place on some type of document. Exactly, something that, um, providing more robust and more meaningful uh, records that students can, that are authenticated by the university and that are, uh, you know, signed off on by the university, that students can present to a potential employer uh, or, or, or for other reasons to help show a more complete picture and really tell the full story of their experiences their competencies uh, and the skills that they have earned along the way that they could bring to a new a new job a new career. Well, I think that sounds very exciting. Yeah, it is. I agree. It is exciting. All right. So, um, why don't um, we talk about how representing Oklahoma State University as the university registrar? has been rewarding to you personally because obviously especially going through COVID I'm sure you put a lot of yourself mm -hmm. into this position mm -hmm. so you know what are some of those rewards that mm -hmm. you can reflect back on? Oh sure um, so personal rewards I think I have uh, I I'm really rewarded every day I'm just gonna uh, honestly I mean um, I just feel so uh, fortunate and so um, blessed to be in this position. It's a wonderful, um, it's extremely fulfilling uh, to be able to come in every day and just help problem solve whatever um, may come uh, our way that day uh, for the university. Uh, every once in a while, uh, you'll receive uh, an email from a, from a student, you know, hey, thanks so much for helping me get enrolled in this class, um, <clears throat> you know, or just helping someone answer uh, a question, something that might be simple for me to answer, but that, you know, is really uh, helpful for someone to, to get on their, uh, on their way or remove a barrier. Uh, being able to f um, implement new technology uh, has been extremely rewarding. Um, uh, we, um, in conjunction with uh, Leslie Evans, she's uh, one of our associate registrars, and with IT again, yay to IT, <laughs> uh, we were able to, in the, in the last, uh, when did we do that? I think it was about 20, 2019, may have been our first year, um, develop a system to expedite uh, awarding of degrees, uh, taking something that, that required manual again taking a piece of paper and having to manually review and check is are all the degree requirements met um, and then manually going into the system and saying for each student yep award this degree award this degree we were able to take that um, and uh, in batch take the the data from the degree audit system that's been verified by our college partners and then in, in batch be able to award the degrees uh, for thousands of students in one day. And so um, something that used to take, you know, weeks and weeks, we can now, uh, as soon as degrees, as soon as grades have been uh, posted, uh, be able to get degrees awarded. It just helps students. I mean, the best part about that is uh, the fact that students can get those uh, transcripts uh, showing that the degree's been earned and show that to a potential employer you know, and move on with their life, um, move on with their new career, uh, and, and succeed faster. Um, I also have, um, I also receive rewards from seeing uh, our team members uh, progress in their careers. We have a lot of folks on, uh, on the team who started out in a very entry-level position, uh, maybe on our front line, you know, and then uh, work their way up um, earn, you know, they gain more skills, more knowledge, um, and then are able to progress in their careers. I find that very rewarding uh, 
to, to see folks um, move up and just be able to increase their contributions and see their own personal fulfillment. So the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education has a website mm -hmm. in which they um, promote, obviously, um, higher education mm -hmm. for high school students. Mm -hmm. And I went and researched, and sure enough, they actually had under their different type of jobs that high school students might be interested in is a registrar. I was actually <laughs> wow. surprised that it was there. So if you um, were presenting to a group of high school students who were trying to kind of figure out based upon what I like to do, my skills, uh -huh. my abilities, and you were gonna sell them on, you should maybe think about becoming a registrar. What would you tell that group of high school students? Well, that's a great question, because I've got to say, whenever registrars get together and we talk about how we got you know, into uh, this field of work, nobody, <laughs> I have yet to meet anyone who said, you know, I, I wanted to be a registrar, or I graduated high school and wanted to get into this field of work. So it tends to be a path that everyone has a unique you know, a, a unique story uh, to tell in terms of how they got there. But for that high school student who has learned about the registrar profession and is interested, I think that I would probably encourage them um, to uh, study whatever um, they're passionate about in college, you know. I don't know that there's a specific degree program that you need. I'd say whatever you're passionate about. and. Um, um, and then um, to pursue a career in higher education. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, the responsibilities of the registrar are very wide. It's very wide, the number of things that we are responsible for um, or that we help to contribute to. Um, and so just getting your foot in the door, you know, an academic advising area would be great or uh, you know an entry-level position in the registrar's office clearly that would be fabulous or even in admissions financial aid bursar um, because the more that you can learn about how the university operates on a variety of levels you know the stronger your background will be um, but then again you can be someone like me who started out in a <laughs> lot of different areas and then i just sort of you know by by chance came to the registrar's office um, and oftentimes having that external perspective uh, can also be a great strength in the registrar's office. I think the key is to be someone who is, uh, you want to cultivate your problem solving skills. Um, your, uh, you've got to have uh, cultivate a great attention to detail um, and then communication is always something that I'm trying to improve on myself. <laughs> Well, Ms. Rita Peaster, we are very pleased that you are Oklahoma State University's University Registrar, and we definitely thank you for all of your time and energy and effort to making the university successful. Well, thank you. It's my honor. So what I think we'll do is we'll uh, let you get a drink, I'll get a drink, and okay. then what I'd like to do is to stage a couple of the things that we, like maybe the first um, course catalog, sure. and we can show one of the um, awards that is handed out, and um, we'll kind of use maybe that little tabletop area, okay. and I'll just move the recorder over there, and then we can kind of just go and just discuss some of the artifacts, sure. and that's a passion of yours, and okay. you have them here displayed so lovely. No, we'll so why don't we go and review some of the artifacts that are located here in the registrar's office? Sure. You know, I've been told that my office is uh, starting to look like a, something of a museum. So <laughs> I guess that I just have a, an appreciation for um, where we've been uh, in terms of the registrar's office and, and, and where we're going. So some of the things I have here, um, this right here, we've got these out. This is a, a medallion, a special kind of medallion that we provide to those who are on the platform party or the stage party for commencement ceremonies. So we have a bunch of new uh, administrators this year. So we've got a bunch of new medallions to hand out for commencement. While I'm talking commencement, I might highlight this is um, a, an old commencement program, kind of a special edition for the 50th anniversary um, of the, the university. This is a, a box 
uh, that we gave to our 2020 graduates. It's a special commemorative uh, box when we had virtual commencement ceremonies. So since we couldn't all be in person, we came, uh, we worked with brand management to design these wonderful boxes and had some gifts and their diploma cover was inside of it. So um, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of an old sap, I guess. I, these things uh, mean a lot to me. You can see I've got quite a few uh, stamps and things down here in the registrar's office before our transcripts were completely digitally produced. Um, we had a lot of stamps to indicate uh, signatures, and there's even one here with mine on it. But anyway, we've got what is this? This is like it says to be posted on their official transcript. Anyway, I won't bore you with all the different types of things, but we've got we used to do lots and lots of stamping of documents. These stamps are from signatures from previous registrars. Um, let's see, this right up here is pretty special. This is one of the oldest um, catalogs that we have. We've got a records library where we uh, retain copies of all the university catalogs that we've had. And this is just a very, um, a very special one because it's, it's by itself. They used to be, whoops, I've got it backwards. Uh, we've got them cataloged in our records library. Um, many years together. This one says 1914 to 1915. So it's really uh, interesting to look at some of these old catalogs and see what the degree requirements um, were like at the time. Uh, they were so simple compared to today. And I've got a catalog from when I was born, 1967 also. So <laughs> anyway, and, and I guess I've got quite a few of our, uh, of our more recent catalogs um, here and a lot of some publications from uh, Acro and, and other things. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> sure.